Good morning, church. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we love to be able to sing to you. We love that even now you're listening to us. We're so thankful for Jesus and all that he did on our behalf so that we could have a relationship with you. And God, right now I pray that as we turn our attention to your word, that you would do a special work in us this morning. So Holy Spirit, I ask, come and do what you do. Change us from the inside out. And I pray that we would leave here today a changed people, that we would be, we would be markedly different because of your word this morning. Jesus, we love you. I pray that you are honored in this. It's in your name we pray. Amen. On Wednesday night, not far from the place where Christian and Hopeful lay, a castle called Doubting Castle was. The owner of it was Giant Despair, and his grounds were where they now were sleeping. When he was getting up early in the morning and walking up and down his fields, he caught Christian and Hopeful asleep on his grounds. He told them to wake up, that they were trespassing on his property, and then they were pushed in front of the giant and made to go into Doubting Castle, into a stinking, nasty, very dark dungeon that nearly broke the spirits of these two men. Far from friends and with no clear way out, giant despair had captured the two pilgrims. Mercilessly beaten with a club, Railed at as if they were dogs, drowning in their own misery, Christian found himself in a place where the journey that he was on to the country over which the Lord reigns seemed now almost pointless. And why should he continue? There's no way out. His companion cannot help him. And his treatment at the hand of giant despair is unbearable. This is from a book published in 1678 by a man named John Bunyan. And it's called The Pilgrim's Progress. And it follows a man named Christian as he is journeying to a new country over which the Lord rules. And it was written over John Bunyan's 12-year prison sentence that he was sentenced to because he was holding an illegal religious meeting where he was preaching the gospel. See, the story is an allegory of the Christian life but many have speculated that when John Bunyan was writing the chapter about giant despair and, the ca and doubting castle, he very much had in mind his own prison sentence. Now, I don't know much more about John Bunyan, but what I do know is that from what I've observed and from what I've experienced, wrestling with doubt and despair is a common thread through every single follower of Jesus' journey. This is something that, 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 that meets all of us. As we are on the road to meet our king face to face in that new country, doubting castle and giant despair often get in the way. And we are left with the question, how do we get out? How do we get through? How do we press on in our journey to that country for which our heart so longs? It's in this, like the weightiness in the heaviness of life, the, the, the doubting castles and the giant despairs, the, the heavy things about life that, that absolutely command our attention. Why? Because the weighty things and the messy things, they're often important. They have a direct impact on our lives, trajectory and on our lives, quality. These things require our attention. They seem urgent and they must be dealt with. Jobs and relationships and money management and time distribution, all of these things come at us and so quickly we find ourselves drawn into doubting castle. See, in 1 Corinthians, we have a snapshot of what our lives are like. This book addresses messy things like sexuality and lawsuits because life is messy. This book addresses uh, 
hardships in the church like head coverings and the Lord's Supper because when we come to church, we're doing this with other broken people. This book addresses our conduct outside of this building in seemingly normal things like marriage and what we eat because sometimes what the Lord would have us do is not always clear and intuitive and we need some direction in these places. This book addresses spiritual gifts because every single follower of Jesus has been indwelt by the Holy Spirit and he desires to work through us so we can build up our brothers and sisters. But the fact of the matter is that's not what we always feel like doing all the time. So we need some help there. The book of 1 Corinthians wastes no time and gets right to rubbing up against the framework of our lives and it forces us to take a sober look. And now, as Paul is approaching the last stretch of what he wants to say in this letter to the Corinthians, he wants one thing in view. He wants the one thing that holds everything else up in front and center. Because even in the difficult things, even in the weightiness and the messiness of our life, even when we are, we are dealing with doubting castle and giant despair, we cannot lose focus on the chief truth of our lives. So let's pick it up in verse 1. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. If you're writing things down this morning, how we're going to go throughout this text is we're going we're gonna to look at four truths that I see in this text. And our first truth is this. The gospel is central to all of life. The gospel is central to all of life. Paul chooses, after a lengthy discussion of difficult issues, to remind them of the good news of Jesus. Paul reminds them of his greatest burden for the church. This good news that was preached by Paul and received by the church is the only thing that establishes them in the family of God. There is no other thing. There is no rule. There is no law that they can look to for confidence. There is no preacher that they can follow and, and, and develop security in their salvation. There's nothing outside of the good news of Jesus that they can know when they take you to the bank. They're standing on ground that is rock solid. And we know this, don't we? We in this room bank heavy on the fact that there is no amount of money we can give, no amount of consistency in church. There's no amount of self-betterment that we can achieve to find security and salvation. Doctrinally, we are really good at saying these things. But when rubber meets the road, how often are we actually thinking like this? A test for you. How long does it take for you to return to the Lord in a full way after a moment or a season of sin? How long does it take you to re return to the Lord in a full way after a moment or a season of sin? How long do you spend carrying the shame and the guilt that follows moments and seasons of sin? How long does it take? Because if I had to guess about this, my guess would be that most of us, we, we, we tend to try to, to go and, and clean up our lives a little bit before we return to the Lord in a full way. That way we can feel more secure when we confess our sin to the Lord or to others. My guess would be that we avoid this particular part of our lives in prayer. That way we, we, we don't have to bring it up. It's almost like we believe that if we're not going to bring it up, then neither will the Lord. And, and you guys know what I'm talking about, especially parents in the room. You know exactly what this is. This is when your kid goes to school, gets a bad grade on a test, or misses a homework assignment, and then doesn't say anything to you about it. Because what they'll do is they'll wait, and they'll make sure they get that grade in the class up, and maybe they won't even tell you at all. But see, here's the thing. They don't feel the need to tell you because at the point where the grade comes up, now they feel that there's no need for a consequence. There's no need to parent the situation anymore because they've fixed it. They have dealt with the situation. It's no longer needed. It's all good. The thing about this illustration and where it breaks down, though, is that parents, you may have to wait for a certain length of time before you find out what's going on with your kid, how your kid has dropped the ball in one way or another. But God knows what's going on as soon as it happens. 
See, we feel like we're able to kind of tuck these things away. Again, if we don't bring it up, then God won't either. And this is all in an effort to find security, not in the good news of Jesus, but in how good we are at cleaning our lives up. Church, the gospel is what saved us. The gospel is what saved us. And it is also the only thing that we should be confident in when we consider our place in the family of God. It is the only thing that secures our salvation. Because when we make the choice to try to clean ourselves up before we return to the Lord, the choice that we are making is actually we're choosing to stay in the shackles that Jesus unlocked for us at the point of salvation. When we repented and believed, he said, you are no longer a slave to sin. You can get up and walk out. But when we try to clean our own lives up, we're saying, no, I'm going to stay here a while and see if I can make it better before I step out. We are choosing to stay in the chains. Jesus said he freed us from when he saved us. And not only that, But the gospel is also the thing that is meant to change your life. What we're bent on doing on our own, cleaning our lives up, trying to fix every problem that we have, trying to to, to look to self-betterment so that we can become a better person, that whole thing where we're trying to just make our lives a little bit better, what we're bent on doing on our own, God intends to do continuously through the gospel throughout our whole lives. The good news of Jesus is the thing that we were saved by one time, but it is also the thing that we are right now, present tense, being saved by. We can speak of salvation in a few tenses. We, y- yes, of course, at the m- moment of, of repentance and faith, you were saved. The gavel came down in the courtroom of God and you were declared not guilty. But in that declaration, it secures something for you. It secures for you throughout this life, this process that we call sanctification. It, it secures for you a life that over time, you're going to look more and more like Jesus. Justification, where the gavel comes down, it happens once and it doesn't change. But sanctification is a process throughout your whole life. This is what we mean when we say being saved. Present tense and ongoing. It doesn't stop. And I want to be clear. This idea of being saved over time does not mean that your eternity or your place in the family of God is any more secure one year, five year, ten years, thirty years into your walk with Jesus. Your place in the family of God and your eternity was secured at the cross in the moment where you repented and believed. That security does not go away. But what happens is as we follow Jesus, we become more like and we begin to experience more and more the freedom that Jesus talks about where we say no to sin because we don't want it. We say yes to Jesus because we want to follow him. Yes, when you met Jesus, all your past sins were taken care of, and God did not just leave the rest up to us. He didn't say, okay, I fixed what's behind you. Now you got to take care of what's ahead of you, because the only true and lasting transformation, the only thing that changes us from one person to another is the good news of Jesus, not us white-knuckling against our sin. This is the thing, church, that present tense, right now, ongoing, we are being saved by. That is, if you have not believed in vain. Now this comment here at the end of verse 2, it it could raise doubt in some of your hearts about your own security and salvation. Like Paul makes room here for for some doubt, like unless you believed in vain. And this, this little part is a clue of what we're going to be looking at next week. What was going on in the church at Corinth was they were getting something wrong. They, they had something wrong about this message. So if we are going to, to really plant our flag and say it is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, it is the gospel that, 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 that we are clinging to for our security and confidence, then folks, we better know what we're talking about because this is a matter of eternal significance. So let's pick it back up in verse 3. Paul writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Our second truth, if you're writing things down, that we observe in this text, is that the gospel is specific and it is most important. The gospel is specific and it is most important. 
See, the thing you got to know about Paul is he is the majority writer of the New Testament. Page for page, there is no other author that we read in the second half of our Bibles that wrote more than Paul did. He is the one who wrote the most in the New Testament. And considering the fact that everything he wrote in the New Testament was all inspired by the Holy Spirit, I would venture to say that he wrote about some pretty important things. Like he spent no ink wasting time on things that were not important. And it is because of this where we need to take pause. Because what happens here is Paul introduces this, con- this, this, this gospel, this, this message, by saying this is most important. He says, out of everything that I've written to you, out of everything that I've given to you in correction and in encouragement, out of everything, this next part is number one. It is most important. Do not miss this. Open your eyes and make sure you catch what I'm about to say next because you need to hear what I say. This is what I received, that Jesus Christ, who lived a sinless life, died in our place as a substitute, and he paid the price that all of us owe for our sin, according to the Scriptures. Also, After he died, he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and the tomb was sealed with a stone, just like the scriptures said it would be. And on the third day after his death, Jesus rose from the grave. The resurrection happened, proving to everyone that Jesus is exactly who he says he is, again, according to the scriptures. Everybody look right at me. If this is not the message that you were told when you were saved, if this is not like the message that you think about when you consider what the gospel is, if, if this is not what you take confidence in your salvation in, please hear me. Whatever else you believe in is bankrupt. Whatever else you believe in is empty and false. It will no more get you to heaven than some silly story that we read. Like it, it, It's not going to help you. So if that's you, if you find yourself in a place this morning and you were just unaware, you, you, you didn't know that this, what it, this is what it was all about. You didn't know that, that this was really the thing that, that, that saves us, that, that moves us from death to life. If, if, if that's where you find yourself this morning, please, even now, it's time to pivot. It's time to pivot right now. Repent and trust this message. Believe the good news of Jesus and experience what salvation really is. Even right now, this is the thing. This is the message. This is the good news, the specific and very important news that Paul wants us to see up front. Now I have two observations about these two verses that I think could be helpful here. My first observation about these two verses is that gospel is a plan that God has had for a long, long time. Long, long time. We see Paul repeat the words according to the scriptures a couple times. This means that this whole thing, salvation, Jesus' life, death, burial, resurrection, this thing that happened, it wasn't an accident. It wasn't just some fluke. It wasn't God kind of navigating his way through a, a difficult situation. This was the plan all along. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God promises Adam and Eve right after they sin that there will be one who comes. There will be one who comes to crush the head of the serpent. And that one who comes is going to take the price of all of your sin and he's going to reconcile you to me. And this is how you and I, we are going to maintain this relationship. And even before that, Ephesians 1 verse 4 gives us a picture into even even before that. It says that before the foundations of the earth was laid, this was the plan. Before anything had been created. This was God's plan to reconcile humanity to himself. This this is no accident. It's no fluke. I take all of this to mean the fact that you are in Christ today. The fact that this is true is no accident. The fact that you are in Jesus is on purpose. It's on purpose. That no matter what your life looks like in the past, no matter what skeletons you have in your closet, no matter what last night or even this morning looks like for you, that it is no accident, that God does not regret saving you, that he wouldn't go back and do it over if he could. He wouldn't change this order of events. He wanted a relationship with you. He wasn't about to let anything out of his control because he desired to have a relationship with you. He wasn't about to let the ball drop even for a second. This is the depth that God loves us 
and cares for us. He was on top of it the whole time. He always had a plan. This was no accident. My second observation about this text is that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, it is a historical event. It is a historical event. Paul discusses the fundamentals of the gospel all the time in his letters. He's always talking about the gospel. He wants his readers' eyes to be pointed to Jesus, and, he, and he's always talking about it. But here in this letter, because of the way he draws our attention to how it is most important, and the way he lays it out in kind of like, like a formal way, we can see that he's making no effort to kind of over-spiritualize this. He, he doesn't want you to think of the gospel as some ethereal situation that, that didn't really happen. He, he doesn't speak of it as an allegory or a story with a moral that teach us about how we live our lives. This isn't fiction. These are real historical events that took place. One author puts it this way. He's commenting on like the concreteness of these events, and he says this, Christ's death was no mere illusion because his body was treated like any other corpse by Roman officials and by his friends who grieved the loss of his life. He goes on to say that this Jesus, a particular human in a particular point in history, in a particular place, at a particular day, like you can mark it on the calendar, this Jesus rose from the dead. We can go back in the calendar and find the day where this happened. This is a concrete historical event, not an allegory. Now, all of us have friends and family who do not believe this. All of us know people, all of us know people who, who look at this message and say that it's nonsense, that it's completely foolish, that we, we, could, we could believe this kind of a thing in, in the age that we live in. We all know people like this, and, and much of their doubt, much of their doubt seems to be wrapped up in the resurrection. This, is, this certainly isn't the least of the issues when it comes to why people don't believe in Jesus. And honestly, it kind of makes sense because that's kind of like where Christianity hinges all the time, isn't it? Like, like whether or not Christianity like, like stands or falls is proven to be true or false. It is all bent on the, like, 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 like whether or not Jesus really did rise from the dead. Whether or not the resurrection actually happened. Tim Keller puts it like this. He said, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept everything he said. But if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything he said? You see, the resurrection of Jesus is the issue, folks. It is, it is the issue. It is the hinge on which the door swings. It is where the rubber meets the road. It is the issue that, that, that we need to make a, uh, like, like, like a, a decision on whether or not we believe it because that informs everything about our lives. Many have written about the seriousness of this claim, either for or against. What's encouraging is that Paul recognized the, serious of this, the seriousness of this claim as well. He knew that like, like contemporary, like, like, like our friends and family, he knew that his readers may like struggle to get there as well to believe in this resurrection. Like this, this kind of thing doesn't happen every day. Like people don't just rise from the dead. He understands the seriousness of his claim. So what follows this is an invitation to his readers to test it. What follows this is an invitation to his readers to test what he has said. Verse 5. And then he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Talking about them dying. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. This is our writer, Paul. Truth number three, if you're taking notes. The gospel is reliable. The gospel is reliable. Because here in these verses, we have one of the best apologetics for the resurrection of Jesus. We have one of the best proofs or, or evidences that the resurrection of Jesus actually Happened. This isn't a myth. This isn't a fairy tale or, or, or a moralistic story. Jesus rose and he talked with people. He moved around and he had conversations. He, he, went to, he went and had meals with people. He ate food after he rose again. He met with 
Peter, and the other disciples. He appeared to over 500 others along with James and the rest of the apostles. And then at the end, Paul includes himself. He also appeared to me, he says. And most of them, when this was written, were still alive. We have Paul saying, go ahead. Go and ask. Find the people. Uh, Like they can either confirm or deny my claim. It's one thing to say, I know something's true because I've experienced it. I, I know something's true because, because this happened in my life. It's kind of like when you have a conversation with someone and they say, hey, listen, you have to, you're not going to believe this. Last night, I saw a UFO. And then you say, are you sure? They go, I, I couldn't be more sure of anything in my life. Like, I saw a UFO. And you go, okay, was, was, was anyone, like, with you? And he goes, no, but it was, it was up in the sky and it was flying around and, and it just does things that, that no other aircraft built by people can do, all right? It, it, it's up there and, and I, I saw it and I know it's there. And then rational people might walk away from that conversation going, I don't know if that's true, okay? I, I, don't, I don't know if that's really what you experienced. But see, that's not Paul's attitude at all. It's not Paul's attitude at all. It's not like this. This is not like that. Paul doesn't even start with himself as proof or evidence that the resurrection, that resurrection took place. He starts with other people, and he includes himself at the end. Paul puts his reputation of, of someone who's respected and, and a good thinker on the line. He says, you know what? There are people out there that can either corroborate or knock down my story. You should go and ask them. He puts his reputation on the line because he knows that this is true. He says, go and ask those people. People, if you need someone to back it up, there are hundreds of them that you can speak to. And it's not just the leaders of this thing. It's not just me and the other apostles. It's 500 average Joes that Jesus appeared to. Because here's the thing, if it was just the apostles that Jesus had appeared to, if it was just the leaders of the early church that Jesus had appeared to, that would leave a crack where doubt could begin to creep in. Because it's kind of like this. Well, of course you kind of need this to be true because... If this wasn't true, then your whole thing doesn't make any sense. Like, like if this isn't true, then, then what you have given your life to is really, really not true. So, of course, he only appeared to you guys. That, 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 that begins to cause doubt in the hearts of the hearers. But here's the thing. That's not what happened. There are plenty of normal people, church people. Church people, they're just going to sit. like they, they do what all of us do. They come and they sit and they serve. Like, like these are the, the, the normal people that Jesus appeared to. There are hundreds that can either confirm or deny my claim. By all means, go and ask them. That gives me great confidence that the resurrection of Jesus actually took place. It gives me great confidence that this really happened. Now as we read this, we're of course not in the same place that Paul's original readers were. We're not able to go and have conversations with these people, right? We're, we're, those people are, are, are long gone, and, and we're not able to have a dialogue to see if they corroborate Paul's claim. However, I think there is a way this morning where we can still test Paul's claim about the resurrection of Jesus, whether or not it actually happened. See, a lot of times we give people in the Bible that we read about a hard time. And we say things like, how was Israel's faith not rock solid? They saw God through Moses part waters and they walked through the middle on dry land. How could they ever return again to worshiping idols? How did they not see it? We love to say things like, I don't know how the disciples' faith wasn't rock Solid. They literally saw Jesus do miracles right before their eyes. We love this. God did this for them. How could they so easily walk away? And honestly, I think it's from a good place that we're coming from. I think that it's coming from a place where we're going, I'd love to see to see water split. I would love to see miracles before my eyes. I'd love to see giants fall down. I would love to see all these things. And if I did, my faith would be so much stronger. Like if God would just do those things, then I'd be able to be able to have a deeper and stronger faith. We do that, but this is not what happened after the resurrection. This is, this is not what took place when Jesus met with all of these people. Jesus rose from the dead, and it says that he met with Peter. He met with Peter. He found him, and they ate fish together, and after a few questions, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says yes. So Jesus restores Peter, after his denial. And after this, 
Peter is all gas and no brakes on preaching the gospel. He is preaching sermons and getting thrown in jail for it, standing up to the authorities saying, there is no way that you are going to be able to change the message that I am preaching. I know this to be true, and I'm not stopping for anyone. This guy, Peter, who couldn't stand up and claim Jesus at a bonfire just a couple months ago, is now standing up before governing authorities, like, like unshakable, like, like Peter changed the resurrection of Jesus, secured something in this man's heart. Seeing his risen king set the heart of Peter on fire. It changed him. And this didn't stop. This passion, this, this fire followed Peter all the way to his death. According to Christian tradition, Peter was crucified upside down for the cause of Christ, and that's how he died. And the same goes for the other 11. They were all martyred, save one, because they tried to kill John, but it just didn't work, so they left him on an island. The question that should rise in all of our minds is that if the resurrection is not true, if it is all fake, then why on earth would these men who knew Jesus and walked with him, why would they maintain their claim through torture and death? Why would they that cling so strongly to this claim through the, the significant suffering that they experienced? It just doesn't make any sense. In fact, they went back to their jobs after Jesus was arrested and crucified. Peter went right back to his little boat. He saw the landscape. He considered his option. He said, you know what? I really messed this up. Jesus is dead. What I need to go do now is abandon this, and I'm going to go back to what I was doing before Jesus came to me. I'm going to go back to my little boat and start fishing again. And this is where the resurrected king, Jesus, finds Peter. He's fishing, and he calls Peter out of the boat again, and he says, let's have dinner. And that is where Peter is restored. And turns him into one of the greatest leaders of the first century church. This coward who is, who is full of fear is transformed into this man who is bold and courageous. Folks, that just doesn't happen overnight like that. Like, imagine if this was all fake. If the reason why we're sitting in this church today, if the reason why I'm up here talking to all of you, imagine for a moment that it's all not true. Could you imagine the conversation in the first century? Peter pulls all of his buddies together. He says, hey guys, I got an idea. What's up, Peter? See, well, I bet we could have some fun playing a joke on some people. Remember Jesus, the guy that we walked with for three years? Remember how he died? We should all say that after he died, he rose from the dead. That would be such a good prank. Okay, Peter, go ahead. I don't really see where this is going, but I'll entertain you. I'll, I'll see where it's going. I like a little bit of, of fun. Things have been kind of dark recently. So Peter responds, right, okay. So we're going to have some women, and they're going to go to the tomb. And the, the stone that, that sealed the tomb, that's going to be rolled away. And, and the tomb is going to be empty. And then they're going to come back and they're going to tell us. And then all of us, we're going to freak out because now the tomb is empty. And then we're going to go and tell people this. And Peter's friends go, whoa, 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 Peter, you got you to gotta slow down, man. A couple of things. First of all, we're sending women. They're, they're, they're not going to be able to be believed here. This is not how our culture works. Their word doesn't mean much of anything. Number two problem with your little plan, Pete, is that that stone is humongous. I don't think we're going to be able to roll that away. And even if we were able to roll it away, there are Roman guards stationed there at all hours, and we are going to get killed if we attempt this. And then there's the issue of the body of Jesus. What are we going to do with it? Peter says, I know, I know, I know. I, I, we'll, we'll, we'll create a plan for all that. Like It's, it's going to go fine. It's going to be good. But I've not even gotten to the best part yet. This thing is going to get so big. All of us, we're going to get to travel the world. And his buddy's like, okay, travel the world. I'm kind of on, on that. We're going to travel the world, and we're going to preach the gospel. And guess what? We're all going to experience mad suffering. We're going to be beaten and stoned and slandered. We're going to be displaced. We are going to be outlaws for the cause of Jesus. This joke that we're, we're playing on people, we're, we're going to be outlaws for the rest of our lives. And Peter's friends go, whoa, man, I, I, 
I don't know if I want to sign up for this. This does not sound like fun. I don't really know where you're getting all of this. And Peter says, oh, no, just wait. At the end of all of it, at the end of of what we're doing, once we take this joke to the nations, what we're going to do is we're going to keep going, and eventually all of us are going to die extremely painful deaths. Like, doesn't that sound like a great time? Now listen, I don't mean to make light of this. The resurrection is miraculous. Like, it's a faith step to believe it. Again, this doesn't happen every day. Like, like none of us are walking around knowing, like, oh, yeah, like, Cousin Joe, like, resurrected from the dead. Like, like, not, like, none of us really, like, have that normal experience. This is a miracle that happened. This is amazing that happened. And it's a faith step to believe it. All I'm saying is that the guys who turned tail and ran to save their own skin are very unlikely to stand strong in the face of such opposition if the resurrection wasn't real. When Jesus was real to them, they turned away and they ran. So if the resurrection wasn't real, I just don't see these cowards standing in for that kind of suffering and torment. The resurrection that is real and is historical and did happen, it secured something in Peter's heart. It gave Peter, in his darkest moment, after his denial of Jesus, gave Peter a key. And it gave him a pathway out of that darkness. And the same can be said for Paul. Verse 9. He says, For I am the least of the apostles. Unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. So whether it was I or they, so we preached and you believed. Our last truth that we're going to consider this morning, fourth and final one, is that the gospel changes lives. Like, really. Like, like the gospel really does change people's lives. See, Paul was the guy who was giving orders for Christians to be killed. You know this story. He was, he was on his way to persecute the church when Jesus stopped him and met him. And it was, this, it was in this interaction, the reality the, of the resurrection, that, that changed everything for Paul. He was bent, he had bent the, the rest of his life solely on the truth that Jesus did rise again. This was the reason that over time, by the grace of God, that Paul became who he became, the greatest missionary of all time. The grace of God so changed Paul to his core that instead of maintaining his job, bringing in the check, keeping up his reputation and choosing security in that world, he goes and preaches the gospel and plants churches and suffers and dies for Jesus in a world where Christianity was brand spanking new. Like Jesus was not even known about in other places, let alone known in a a salvific way. Like like Jesus was brand new information. Paul went from a guy making every effort to stop the spread of that news to, to, to the guy that made every effort to make sure that this good news went to the whole world. This is what the grace of God in the resurrection of Jesus did in Paul's life. He flipped his life upside down, folks. And again, I want to bring it up that even though we read these stories in a book, these things really happen. It's not a fairy tale. These are real events. You can go and visit the places where Paul ate, and you can go visit where he walked, and you can visit where he preached and taught. You can go and visit these places. Paul was not just a story character. He was a man whose life was radically changed by his creator. So go and read about these events in the book of Acts. Go and see all that God did through Paul's ministry. Go and see Paul, him going from place to place to place, taking ships and making long journeys on foot to plant new churches. Read about Paul and other leaders meeting in Jerusalem, discussing like what we're discussing today, what it is exactly that saves people from their sin. Read about uh, Paul going to Athens in Greece and, and debating the best thinkers of that age. Read about Paul setting sail for Rome in an untimely way and finding himself in, 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 in a shipwreck on an island like to preach the gospel. Like, like go and read about this. Like these are events. They happened. 
they're there for us to read. We have these accounts. Now notice for me that in all of that, the gospel, and specifically the resurrection, it didn't cause Paul to relax more. It didn't cause Paul to say, you know what, now that I know this, I'm good. I can sit and chill. I don't have to be worried about following the law anymore. I don't have to be scared of sin anymore. I I, I can just kind of sit on my haunches and let my life pass me by. No, the grace of God caused Paul to work really, really hard. He gave preaching the gospel everything he had. And these men, Peter and Paul, and so many more flipped their lives upside down because this message is true. Now, for us in the room... Whether you were saved as a child or you were saved in college or even maybe today is the day that you repented and believed for the first time and today is the day that you were saved, I have a question for you. What is the hang-up in your life from going all in with Jesus? What's the barrier? What's the area of your life that you continue to say, yeah, I struggle here, but I'm, I'm working on it. What is the step of obedience that you need to take that you have been avoiding for the longest time? What is God doing in you to transform you more and more into the image of Jesus, but you keep on resisting it week after week? What is the root of your doubt that honestly just needs to be stepped past in faith and given to the Lord? See, if you find yourself in any of these places, I'm going to urge you this morning to look at your resurrected king. Look at Jesus. Look at the man who conquered death on your behalf. See, death is a universal truth. It's coming for all of us. None of us can escape it, and most of us sitting here have felt the sharp sting of death of a family member or a close friend. Maybe some of you in here have have a diagnosis and you can almost feel death beginning to knock at the door. See, thinking about death makes us uncomfortable. And, And being around death makes us relearn how we need to live our lives. Richard Baxter, he's a preacher from the 1600s. He famously said this, that when he preached, he preached like he was a dying man preaching to dying men, noting the urgency of the gospel. He preached as if every time he preached was the last time he was going to be preaching, and he preached as if the the people in the congregation, that this was going to be the last time they ever heard preaching. So he got after it. So this morning, as a dying man to dying men and women, I preach to implore you to see the one who conquered what none of us could conquer. I'm asking you, I'm, I'm urging you, like, 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 look to the risen Jesus, the one who conquered death. Take a good, long look. Gaze at your resurrected king and pray that God would do what he did in the heart of Peter and in the heart of Paul and the heart of, of reformers and the heart of martyrs across the century. Pray that what God did in them because of the resurrection, pray that he would do it in your life. Because we see people turn their lives upside down because of of the resurrection, because it is true. I'm just wondering how many of us in here still have our lives right side up. Resurrection secures something in the hearts of people who buy in 100%. We can know that like Jesus was raised, he will also raise us. And that has every implication to how we live our lives. On Wednesday night, Christian and Hopeful found themselves asleep in giant despair's fields. And they were captured and they were prodded along into Doubting Castle. And they were held there for days, captured, railed at, beaten, and drowning in misery. Christian found himself in a place where his journey to the country which he's going seems nearly pointless. And why should he continue? There's no way out. His companion cannot help him. And his treatment at the hand of giant despair is unbearable. 
But on Saturday, at around midnight, the pilgrims began to pray. And a little before dawn, good Christian, in amazement, passionately said, What a fool I am to lie in a stinking dungeon when I have freedom right here in front of me. I have a key in my coat called promise that I am sure of it will open every single lock in Doubting Castle. And it did. And Christian and Hopeful both made it to the celestial city. They both made it to the country to which they were going, over which the Lord rules. Brothers and sisters, in the resurrection of Jesus, it is a promise that I am sure will open every single lock in Doubting Castle. So let's fix our eyes on that.